Today, we're going to do a walkthrough of our 2.2 liter water boxer motor and some of the unique details that we put into it. We had our water boxer motor rebuilt back in 2016 by Rocky Jennings out in Walla Walla. He is probably still the premier water boxer engine rebuilder in the US. It just happens to be about a four or five hour drive from our house. So for us, the decision was pretty simple. When we decided to get it rebuilt, we were on the fence. Do we go Subaru? Do we stay water boxer? Do we go diesel? At the time, rebuilding the water boxer was the easiest and cheapest solution and one that would get us back on the road as quickly as possible. There was nothing inherently wrong with our old motor. Um, it just had you know, a significant amount of miles with an unknown you know, rebuild in the past, like a lot of these vans that you buy said. So with as much traveling as we did, we decided over the winter of 2016 to send it off to Rocky and have it rebuilt. Some of the things we did while the engine was out was to replace all the metal coolant pipes with the stainless steel ones from Go Westy. Ours looked to be in okay shape. The, the main one from the water pump down was a bit rusty on the outside like most of them are. But for us, it was a really easy time to do it, right? There was, when the engine came back from Rocky, it was fresh and clean. Put these nice, fresh, clean parts on that you'll never have to worry about ever again. They're made from beautiful stainless steel. We did the ones off the water pump, the, the big one that goes to the back um, by the thermostat the crossover pipe that goes behind the uh, crank pulley, all those are all stainless steel. At the same time, we replaced the coolant tower with the stainless steel unit as well. Ours was in pretty bad shape. And, and not that I don't think plastic would be fine. It lasted for, what, 30 years or so. I'm not as confident in the aftermarket plastic parts as I am the OEM. If I can go to Volkswagen and buy the OEM piece, I probably would have done that. But for us, stainless steel was the way to go on all those. We also replaced the thermostat housing on the engine with the synchro version, which is a cast aluminum versus the plastic piece that the two-wheel drives come with. One of the things I liked about that is it goes from those sensors, the, the temp two sensor that pushes in with a clip that tend to leak sometimes, especially when the engine gets cold, to a screw-in sensor, which you know is really much more of a, a better way to seal that. So we got that from GoSD as well. We just replaced all the things we could while the engine was out that could fail in the future because it was just a lot easier and cheaper to do it all at one time. When I put the synchro thermostat housing on, at the same time I also built a little heat shield that screws into the thermostat housing, the back side of the threads because the bolts don't go all the way down, out of a piece of aluminum and then covered it in some insulating high heat um, tape to kind of keep that radiant heat from that exhaust header that's right there on that cylinder from, I guess, overheating or maybe affecting the temperature of that, um, your temperature gauge um, sensor is right there. Now, I don't think it does anything in terms of the sensor itself. I'm just trying to keep the additional heat away from the wiring and the sensor in hopes it'll maybe last longer. It was easy to do. It was, the engine was out. It was a super easy project. Whether or not it helps or not, I don't know. After we put the engine in, I decided to put an oil separator in from the breather tower to the air intake. The breather towers are kind of an odd design. The diaphragm can rip, and then it just kind of has blow by from your engine case into your intake, which I guess in the end of the, it's not the end of the world. It will burn back in there, but it gives you kind of a, a sludgy, oily intake manifold. Not only the oil, but the little sludge you get if you don't warm your engine up enough. You'll notice kind of a white sludge occasionally. It's the water vapors in there mixing with the oil. Um, those usually burn off when you run the engine for a, a high enough temperature long enough, but we decided to get a MAN ProVent 3, and what it does, it routes the air from the breather tower into it, and then basically the, the oil and water separate, they drop out, um, because it's a, it goes from a small diaphragm to a larger opening. They drop out into a little catch can, 
and the, the cleaner air, it's not clean, clean, but the cleaner air goes back in the intake that way. Um, and we usually empty that little catch can every time we change the oil. An oil cooler is something I think every water boxer uh, motor should have, especially if you're going to be overloaded, climbing bigger passes like we do. Um, the, the water boxer motors tend to have higher oil temperatures anyway. We really didn't know until we put the gauge in and we were routinely seeing temperatures of 240 or higher on some of the long climbs in second gear where there just isn't a lot of airflow and you're just running the ninja pretty high. Intrepid Overland makes a fantastic kit. That was the kit I was going to go with. The one thing that really kept me from it was I wasn't a fan of having the oil cooler on the passenger side. Um, it routes those hoses all over the engine, and I'm sure it's fine. It's a great kit. It's just a lot of hose, a lot of spots where those hoses could chafe and lose some oil pressure. And I like to do my stuff myself, so I decided to make my own kit. I sourced, and I think it's, uh, I'll put it in the description, maybe a 10-row oil cooler, and I'm putting all this on the, on the driver's side. We did AN fittings, we did a sandwich adapter, and then fittings that go from the sandwich adapter up to the oil cooler. On the back of the oil cooler, I've got a small fan on a switch. I was going to put it on a thermostat, but for me, I like to be able to control that, kick that, temp that, that fan on before we go up a long hill climb. That way I can kind of be proactive with that, keep those temperatures at 220 or so. If you're interested in getting an oil cooler, I will put the, in the description all the parts I use from the different places. I did fabricate the bracket to hold the oil cooler, and what you're really trying to do is put it in this area so all the air from this vent has to pass through it. Um, as it goes back down the engine. After we put the oil cooler on, that sandwiched adapter plate adds maybe inch and three quarter or so to the really the, how much the oil filter hangs down. And though we've never had an issue with that, um, it seemed a little suspect to me. So I, I found on, on Amazon, of course, this oil filter cover. I think it's supposed to help aid in cooling because it's got some fins and stuff. That's not what I cared about. I really wanted the protection from my a rock or something being kicked up on the trail, a stick not get poked through a now more suspect oil cooler hanging a bit lower. While the engine was out at Rockies being rebuilt, I took the whole engine compartment, you know, cleaned it all up, um, cleaned up any wiring. And one of the things that, that Volkswagens in general, I've been working on Volkswagens for, you know, 30 years now, aren't known for great grounds. And the, the Westies and the Vanningens are no exception. They kind of all cobbled together on the, onto the, I guess you call this firewall aside over here. You know, they were old and corroded, so I took them all apart. I built all new ground uh, cables, and I also decided to take and make a ground tree back there. So all of the grounds that come from the engine and other parts don't have to go through one or two bolts that we hope is a good ground. There's two grounds. One goes from the block of the engine, and another one comes from the heads. And then I have one four-gauge ground wire, or maybe two-gauge, that goes from the ground tree all the way up to the battery negative cable as well. So everything should be well grounded. Um, for me, that's been a, I don't have any thoughts on grounds anymore. I also grounded from the starter housing to the frame as well. When we put the TDI starter in the van, just one more path for the grounds to get through so it doesn't go through parts of your engine that it's not supposed to go through. One of the things that we recently added isn't really the engine, of course, but it is allowing us some more ease of working on the engine is installing these little lights, these LED lights above the engine compartment. I wired them in and put an extra outlet up here as well for um, you know, if you need to plug a USB some device back there or for an air compressor. These are on all the time. They're, they're hot wired. I can just click them on and off um, and they allow a lot better light of the engine. If something happens at night, I don't have a flashlight or it dies. I also put one as well on a switch down below on an LED strip that lights up more by the transmission and stuff. It's, uh, it's also nice if you're on the side of the road, um, broken down maybe, and you've got these lights in the back that help alert traffic to where you're at. Well, that is it for our engine walkthrough video. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you have any comments or questions about what we did or things that you've done to your engine um, that you think would be helpful for others, please drop them down below, and we'll see you next time.